Hello and my series of tours around aviation icons continues today with this Qantas Boeing 747-400 here at the Haas Aviation Museum in Albion Park just south of Sydney. Now the 400 series was the first major upgrade and modernization of the 747 and in this video I'm going to take you on a detailed tour of this aircraft showing you the quirks and features of this amazing piece of engineering. So let's go and check it out. I make videos about planes. If you're into trip reports from flights around Australia and the world, and tours through significant aircraft and museums, then please check out my channel and subscribe. I'm also on Instagram and Facebook. Now I will be repeating some of what I said in my 747-200 classic tour, although this video will be in a lot more detail and you can skip ahead by clicking on the timestamps. An obvious question is why the upper deck was so narrow and didn't extend the full length of the aircraft, like we see with the Airbus A380. Back when this aircraft was designed, they were expecting that passengers would prefer supersonic flight in Concorde and a Boeing's own 2707, and the 747 would essentially just be carrying freight. By having the flight deck up on top, you could open up the whole nose section allowing easy access to large cargo. In fact, if you look closely, you can see the line where this door would join the rest of the fuselage. These two prongs here are the pitot tubes which measure airspeed, and there's multiple on the other side as well to act as redundancy in case one fails. It's also interesting to see these humans near the forward landing gear as it highlights just how big the whole aircraft actually is. This little circle here is the MEC cooling valve. Now just above that, and we'll explore there shortly, is a whole array of potentially quite hot electrical equipment, and the cooling air escapes here. This small red antenna communicates with air traffic control and this red Jaffa is the VHF antenna. This small yellow antenna here and the one a few meters behind it is for the DME which stands for Distance Measuring Equipment, which is an older navigation device. This works by sending a radio signal to a known ground station such as the destination airport which then sends one back allowing the distance to be calculated. This door, which comes labelled, is the electronic equipment hatch and this red and white thing is called a mass drain. This is where any liquid that is sent down the drain goes, but because it's freezing at high altitudes, the liquid has to be heated up before it's expelled, hence why there's a warning that it's hot. Otherwise, the liquid itself would freeze and then block the end of the tube. These little squares here are the low range radar altimeters, which, as the name suggests, works out the absolute distance above the ground, and this long white object is the marker beacon, which is a VHF beacon involved in ILS landings. Open and on display is one of the three heat exchangers in the air conditioning unit. The pressurized air is bled from the jet engines, but it's obviously very hot so there are two vents here and one on the other side that draw in cold air that cools the air down before going into the cabin. And then that cold air from the outside is then expelled down via these vents underneath. Now if there is a problem and the pressure builds too high, these circular release valves will blow out and protect your ears amongst other things. Now speaking about engines, this is the fifth engine pod. If an engine breaks down at a distant port, the airline can literally carry another one on another 747. This saves having to rent a large cargo plane to fly one out. And speaking about the engines, here's engine number two, a Rolls-Royce RB211, which is an iconic turbofan and used across many aircraft, including the 757, 767, L1011 TriStar, and even the Tupolev Tu204. You may recall from my 707 tour that these engines are considerably wider than the older turbojets, but it's mostly just air, as you'll see when we look from the back. These are high bypass engines, which means that the majority of the air bypasses the hot core where the air will be compressed and ignited. As well as the core itself producing thrust, it also turns a big fan at the front which spins and acts as a massive propeller, so essentially these are both jet and prop engines. Combining these designs increases efficiency and lower noises. An F-22 fighter jet, for comparison's sake, just has a very large and powerful thirsty hot core. Well, two of them in fact. 
Now, if you look from the back, you can see just how much of the engine is just space with the core in the middle, and then you can see the fan in the distance, which would be blowing air both into the core itself and around it. We'll spin around and go and have a look at the main landing gear. Most aircraft, including pretty large aircraft such as the 777, only have two main landing gears, as does the 707 from Longridge, you can see now. In contrast, the 747's main landing gear is far more complex with 16 wheels that spread the weight over a larger area. Having said that, it can still land if only two opposing landing gears are deployed, as everything was over-engineered just to be as safe as possible. Now what the camera really doesn't show is how massive the wheel well is, and that piping is involved with the air conditioning. Now let's jump out to the end of the wings. Now these wing tips, which were added with the 400 series, may not look particularly large, but they're actually 1.8 meters high and improve efficiency. This pipe here is the valve to dump fuel, and this vent is a NACA duct. This, and there's one on the other side, allows air to escape when the fuel tanks are being filled on the ground, and then during the flight it allows air to replace the fuel that has been burned. On the forward, or the leading edge of the wings, are Kruger flaps, which work to increase lift at low speed. They fold out from underneath, as you can see in this onboard footage. And on the trailing edge are the three-part slotted flaps, which you can see now in this in-flight footage. These increase the wing's surface area, and while they do look pretty flimsy, they actually improve lift by up to 90%. Now these pods you're seeing behind the wings are not fuel tanks as some people suspect, but rather simple aerodynamic covers for the flaps extension mechanisms. They themselves are just metal linkages that wouldn't be particularly aerodynamic, hence the smooth pod that covers them. The actual wing fuel tanks are further within the wings themselves. Continuing our walk, there is another antenna and another mast drain. In earlier aircraft, the mast itself would be pretty small, but they found that things like coffee and Coca-Cola were leaving nasty skid marks along the aircraft's underside, so they figured that they should release it a little further away from the aircraft's skin. And behind this door is the sewerage. These two air vents at the back are the outlet valves for cabin air. Now if we flip around and look from the behind, you'll see the outlet for the auxiliary power unit. This is actually another smaller jet engine that essentially runs the aircraft systems when the main engines are turned off, such as when you're boarding the plane. Now here's one that has been removed from a 747 for you to have a look at. The air is drawn in from the top and then it's expelled out the back. If we take a step back, and it's a little difficult because of the fence, but with the 400 series, they redesigned the horizontal stabilizers and inserted 12,000 litre fuel tanks, providing an extra 650 kilometres of range. You can do the maths yourselves, but those fuel figures sound pretty similar to my old XR8. Now, before we head inside for a detailed visit to the flight deck in the cabin, let's climb up into the MEC and the forward storage hold. Now everything I've done today, including climbing up through this electronic equipment access hatch, is open to the public in their Platinum Tours, and I can't emphasize enough how much you have to come and visit and do this tour if you're an AvGeek. My tour was run by a retired 747 pilot, customer service manager, and a licensed aircraft maintenance engineer who all worked for Qantas and on this very aircraft, and it was an awesome day. Up the ladder and immediately spinning around forward, you've got electronics and the mechanism for the forward landing gear. Now here's a screenshot of the same position in a 747-200 and you'll notice that it's all pretty sparse, and that red handle there is to manually lower the landing gear. Back in the 747-400, you'll see a lot more electronic equipment, and they've removed the manual release because the reality is that if the hydraulics did fail, they'll just open up the doors and gravity will pull the landing gear down spinning around and you'll see the main equipment systems all lined up. The pedo static system here yep. connects through to the air data computers. Yep. Um, you've got generator control units through here, bus control units, so that controls the power going to the buses. Um, you've got the data management computers, 
we've got the um, maintenance computers, so these are the central maintenance computers, yep. three of them. They compare information that comes in. The three systems for the air data computer compares all that information as well. And there's three for redundancy? Three for redundancy, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, flight control computers, all the flight controls are controlled through this computer here. Yeah. Stab trim, uh, flap control, your damp. Yeah. Let's continue around to the forward luggage hold. Remember that at altitude, the air pressure outside the plane is a lot less than inside. Most aircraft doors open inwards so that if there was a failure of the locks, they don't blow out. But obviously there's no room for that in the cargo compartment, so the locking mechanism has to be extra sturdy. And here it is in action. Those green oxygen cylinders are the emergency oxygen tanks for passengers. You might recall cylinder number four exploding on QF-30, the 747 that was flying over the Philippines a few years ago. Cabin pressure was lost, they quickly descended to 10,000 feet so they could all breathe again, and they are diverted to Manila without injuries. Those four tanks down the very end are for drinking water, and behind that is the central fuel tank. And then further behind that is the landing gear wheel well and then the aft storage hold. Spinning around, we've got an air conditioning unit which was added for the museum display. While both fore and aft luggage holds are pressurised, only the aft one is heated, therefore important luggage such as animals will always go back there. Now let's make our way outside again, but I thought it might be interesting to crawl a little way forward towards the nose. You've got more electronic equipment in here and insulation and it was just an incredible experience to crawl around inside the innards of a Boeing 747, especially when I'd actually flown in this aircraft as a passenger a few times. Now that's the nose straight ahead, so I'm fairly sure that I'm actually now further forward than the flight deck. And being a hopeless millennial, I figured that it might be the time to film a selfie, although I didn't realise until afterwards that I'd actually forgotten how to wear a hat. You'll see a ladder here which you can use to crawl up into the forward passenger cabin where we'll go shortly, uh, and then down the hatch out underneath the aircraft. By the way, this aircraft itself is unique because back in 1989, it broke international records by flying non-stop from London to Sydney. It took 20 hours and nine minutes and it really pushed the limits of the aircraft. In fact, they used a tug to take it out to the runway so that they could literally just turn it on and then immediately take off as to avoid using any unnecessary fuel. Then in 2015, it did a short 12 minute flight from Sydney to the Haas Museum in Albion Park and here's footage I captured from that incredible day. The 400 series maintained the stretched upper deck of the 300 series and for comparison's sake, here's a 200 series from Longreach with the shorter upper deck but a major change was with the electronics. Remember that the 747 was designed in the 1960s and while the airframe remained sturdy, all of the other systems were pretty old, so they were upgraded, as you'll really notice in the flight deck shortly. By the way, what an iconic view looking back at the massive wing and engines. Let's take a left first and explore business class in the nose. Because of the nose curving inwards, the passengers in seat 1A can actually see a little forward. But what's also very cool is that they're actually sitting in front of the flight deck. In fact, the flight deck is actually above row 3. These business seats were the Skybed Mark 1s, and they were a huge upgrade from the previous recliner lounges and almost went completely flat, although at a bit of an angle. There were amusing stories of people waking up having slid down the seat with their legs up against the chest. 
Okay, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but they're in business, so we're allowed to tease them. Now underneath a mat is the access hatch down into the MEC, which by the way stands for Main Equipment Centre, which is where we were just crawling through a few minutes ago. This hatch is useful if the crew need to access any of the equipment during the flight. We'll wander through the business cabin further, and on the right is a galley although we'll explore that in more detail soon. There's a few more rows of business class, and then you've got these wider seats in premium economy. We'll pull a right and then head up the iconic 747 stairs. In earlier models, they were spiral staircases, although these more plain ones use up a lot less room. Upstairs and immediately on the right you've got this crew rest spot and at the back of the upper deck is a galley and then rows of business seats. In earlier models the upper deck was just a first class lounge although obviously the accountants decided that they could make more money by filling it with seats. As I mentioned earlier a major upgrade included new electronics including a glass cockpit and they removed the flight engineer as their role essentially became computerised. Now if I freeze the view now, you'll notice that there are a lot of large screens. Now let's contrast that with the 200 series where everything is analog. By the way, I do keep mentioning the 200 series and there is a tour through that aircraft on my channel. On the left, you've got the crew oxygen cylinders and hidden in there would have been the crash axe to help the crew fix any disagreements if they both wanted the same meal options. Above you is the crew escape hatch and there's the escape reels which you would use to help get you down from the escape hatch, which is a good motivation for pilots to be good at pull-ups. I'll temporarily hand over to my guide for the tour, but as I said earlier, it's really awesome having an actual pilot who flew this very aircraft sharing their experiences with me. So I'll just sit over here. Yeah, yeah, for it. Yeah. Yeah. Got, yeah. But, uh, captain left seat, first officer right seat. Yeah. Uh, you got your uh, primary flight display. In front of the uh, blue of the sky on the ground of the earth, you've got the nav display set up at the moment to go to Sydney down to Melbourne. As you work your way across, you've got the uh, standby attitude indicator. You've got 150 minutes of emergency power if you get total instrument or electrics phone. You've got the engine instruments in the centre, that's the ICAS. And the centre shows your engine instruments. Also, we can select the, that's the upper ICAS. We've got the lower ICAS shows us all these different uh, modes which we can select from that panel there. Do it as you go if you want. Okay. Cool. Uh, you got your flight management computers. That's where the jumbo's given. So you got the uh, data entry on that one. Yeah. And that puts in your flight plan, all your uh, all your um, navigation instrumentation requirements. Also the uh, thrust settings for takeoff. Yeah. Over over there on the captain's side. But that, that wasn't in the classic 200. No. Yeah. No. This is all the new computers. Yeah. So you can fly the jumbo with two pilots. It's certified yeah. captain. First off, so the classic jumbo had Captain First Officer and an engineer, Ford engineer was on that panel. Yeah. What was on that panel is now all overhead, so the old engineer's panel yeah. was actually all incorporated overhead. Okay. So on this side you've got <coughs> auxiliary power unit control, electrical control, that's engine one, two, three and four. You've got the hydraulics, yeah, you come up here, that's uh, emergency lights, you've got the uh, fire engine fire switches to shut down the engines in case of a a fire, that's the auxiliary power unit. Yep. We can actually, um, if we get a cargo fire, we can discharge forward or aft cargo with a, um, there's four bottles, uh, dish, uh, the fire agent in this, this aircraft, yep. but the extended range jumbos had six bottles. Okay. You've got the start switches, pull on those to start the engines. If you want to dump fuel, that's the select A or B, yep. and we push those on, and lay the nozzles at the end of the wing and start dumping fuel. Yep. That's all your uh, fuel control panel. And down here's your uh, anti-ice switches yep. for all the engines in case of anti-ice, that's wing anti-ice. Yep. You've got your wiper blades, windows are always heated, keep them uh, pliable in flight, so that's always on. It, on. It's off at the moment, but in flight they're always on. And you come up here, you've got your uh, emergency locator transmitter, 
so they can find the aircraft in the move. So it's activated on uh, like an impact, I think it's 20G. Yeah. Passenger options and switches are backup. We depressurize as part of our emergency procedures. We'll turn that on as we commence the emergency descent to back up the oxygen mask dropping in the cabin. Yeah. Uh, you've got your damper up and upper and lower powered by the hydraulic systems, helps keep stabilise the aircraft against a normal flight. Therapeutic oxygen, we can actually supply oxygen to each uh, passenger row and the customer service manager often would request us to turn that on for additional oxygen. If they weren't using bottles, we can actually get therapeutic oxygen on okay. the oh, customers yeah. for longer yeah. term needs. That's your uh, landing altitude, but it's automatically set in the flight management computer. It will automatically know what the landing altitude is and adjust the pressurization accordingly. But we can manually set the landing altitude. Yep. That's your isolation valves and the wing ducts, left and right, they're normally on. So if a, a duct blows out, there'll always be at least enough air to two air conditioning packs to keep your pressure off. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, yep. they're, 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 uh, they're yeah, left and right manifold. You've got your passenger temperatures. We set it to about A, which is on both sides is about 23 degrees centigrade. So that's for the passenger and also the flight deck. You've got a zone reset. If there's a problem with the packs, you can push that. Trim air is what comes out of your little, uh, your little vents above your head. Oh, yeah. That's a, additional air. You've got upper and low recirculating uh, air recirculation. So it actually is designed as a fuel saving measure to recirculate the air and we don't uh, lose as much. We put half cargo heat on if we're carrying animals. There's a, the bulk hole. And there's a switch in there we can actually turn on like, the aft cargo heat to top, stop the dogs from chilling down okay. in yep. flight so they yep. don't end up with little cold dogs. Yep. We go high flow to help clear the um, clear the, uh, the air, we go high flow on the ground to get more cooling. Yep. Uh, that's your, uh, that's your, your, uh, or your gasper, sorry that's the gas question. So trim is actually uh, part of the air conditioning system. Gasper is yep. actually what comes out over your head. Okay. There's a humidifier. Yeah. To try and keep the air uh, nice and moist, but they were actually deactivated in the end because it wasn't worth the trouble with maintenance. Yeah, Here's okay. your packs, one, two, and three. So they're your air conditioning packs we turn on. Oh, yeah. Pressurise and condition the air. Yeah. Uh, there's your, uh, that's your, uh, oh, oh, sorry, that's your isolation valve. Sorry, I had a tough info. That's your isolation valve. Yeah. That's your uh, manual outflow valves for the pressurisation so we can control oh, yeah. it. Yeah. That's your uh, isolation valves for the back, and there's your engine bleed, bleed air system. So those valves, normally have to be on to get bleed air out of the engines. Okay, yeah. Uh, there's your lighting, your lights. Yep. So that's your uh, beacon light when you uh, nav lights for uh, lighting the aircraft at night. Strobe lights at the end of the wing. Yeah. Wing lights, logo lights, what illuminates the tail, and you can see the company logo. Oh, yeah. And there's your, basically all your other lights, landing lights in the wings. Yeah. And then down to the mode control panel here, that's the, uh, each, each uh, EFES panel controls the display on the nav. And you can also set your, your altimeter on that, that switch. Yeah. Uh, this is your uh, barrow, uh, barometric altitude, which is, you can set barrow there, or we can set a radar altitude for uh, low visibility uh, landings. And that's your uh, map display, that's uh, the range on the map, out to 640 miles. When we, we turn on the radar normally by pushing the uh, weather radar switch. And you can bring up station waypoint on your map display, airport, data position, and also terrain's important. The terrain switch is there uh, and it displays a uh, worldwide map of terrain. It will show you if you're getting too close to terrain, basically in colours of green, amber, and, and uh, red. Okay. Yeah. And we also have a terrain warning system. If you get too close, it'll actually go terrain, terrain. If you keep assisting with it, it'll actually go whoop, whoop, pull up, and you get a sign, and then you've got to carry out a, a manual manoeuvre. Yeah. So that's Full thrust, uh, pitch 20 degrees, uh, nose up, or you're disconnecting the autopilot, yeah. disconnecting the auto throttle manually. Manually you push the, the uh, thrust levers all the way forward, pitching to 20 degrees, nose up to clear the terrain. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And that's your uh, airspeed indicator we set uh, on whatever airspeed we want to fly. That's to, this is the control panel for the uh, autopilot. We, lateral, that's L nav, lateral navigation, vertical navigation. Uh, heading, we can set. Usually set for that was set up for Sydney runway 165, and the first uh, expected initial altitude. And then once we get onto air traffic control, departure control, I'll probably change that and yeah. even airspeed. That's an initial airspeed just for uh, what we call our V2 speed. And then as we uh, as, as we accelerate, uh, the pilot flying say engage the autopilot or the other pilot will actually set the newest speed as you climb out. And usually set to 250 knots below 10,000 feet. And then once you um, once you're, once you're uh, above that, you can accelerate to your normal points. 
speed was at about 310 knots, maybe 320. Yep. Here's your auto. Look, we've got other controls. Uh, you've got vertical speed switch. We can hit altitude hold. The aircraft will try and alt level off and altitude you're already out. We've got localizer for the instrument approach and the uh, approach is actually broad slope. Left autopilot, center autopilot, right autopilot. And this, this panel here controls what's on the lower display. And that panel's the same as the other side. Yeah. All right. So in the ICAS, uh, you can bring up fuel display. If I push fuel, I don't know if this is going to work. Sorry, I just have to do that. You can actually see what's in the tanks at the moment. It's zero. Uh, and uh, when it's it's fueled up, we'll, we'll put on the boost pumps to coincide with what fuel is in the tanks before takeoff. Uh, After that, we went through a few engine starts takeoffs and engine fire checklist, which was incredible fun and the most realistic experience before getting into an actual airline simulator. Number two fuel control switch confirmed, cut off. Number two fire switch confirmed, pull. It was an incredible aviation nerd experience to sit in the captain's chair of a Boeing 747 and push all four throttles forward, all while picturing this actual footage I captured a few years ago flying this very plane out of Sydney Airport. I'll mention this little device here as it's actually the steering wheel and this sitting here where the flight engineer used to be shows how old this aircraft actually is. It's a disc drive for those old three and a half inch discs that I saw in primary school and they were used to update some software on the aircraft. Now considering we're next to a massive aircraft hangar, this view shows just how high the 747 actually is. Now let's head back down the stairs and join a retired Qantas customer service manager for the rest of the tour. Now if there was a fire in the lower levels, obviously the smoke would rise and fill the flight deck, so here on the left is an airtight cover that they would bring across and block the smoke from entering. We'll head down the stairs and spin around underneath them. Behind this door is an elevator which can lift a trolley up to the upper decks. In the 200 series they would also go down as there was another galley in the forward cargo hold. And directly under the stairs is the customer service manager's station. In here they could control the in-flight entertainment, uh, announcements, safety videos, lighting, call bells and communicate with other staff. On the other side is more equipment for the mill service. There's the water boiler and the coffee machine where freshly ground coffee or tea could be put in there. Next up there's more storage space and a heated compartment uh, and then there's the ovens. They're electrically heated conduction ovens, where you could fit 36 economy meals, although this galley was for business and premium economy. But before they cooked, they kept it fresh in this chilled section. Now if you look down inside here, you'll see two squares. Now if you pull out one of the trolleys, you'll see that there's two similarly sized square vents. So when the trolley is pushed in and against those, it opens up a valve so cold air flows directly through the vent and into the trolley, keeping everything cold and fresh. And to create more workspace, there were these drop down benches everywhere. Now let's continue walking back through premium economy. You'll notice that the seats here are still pretty wide although they don't fold flat or angle flat like the ones in business. And here we are entering the economy cabin where obviously the seats are smaller. On the left here is a private crew rest area and I'll show you the bunk beds down the back shortly. 
saw it, there was a big a wider chair in there. I saw yeah. it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. There's a collection of four toilets here, but just swinging back around is the storage area for the defibrillator and where the flexi cuffs were kept. Now they're legally allowed to arrest and handcuff passengers who were up to mischief, although fortunately that very rarely happens. Now this footage really highlights just how wide the 747 was. Remember that it replaced the 707, which was only as wide as a narrowbody 737, which we see zipping around at domestic routes today. You can really understand why something this big was just mind-blowing when it was introduced. Here we are in the rear galley, used for economy class passengers. This is the rear galley. Up top are more storage spots and in the middle are more ovens and then below that are the chilled carts. On the other side is more of the same equipment as you have to remember that they had 270 passengers in economy to feed. You've got the bun warmers which interestingly inside is now graffitied with a whole lot of amusing messages from the crew. One said, may the beautiful Illawarra sun shine down on the flying kangaroo for years to come. And quite amusingly, another one said, OJA back to rescuing more A380s in 2015. Through there is a hole to look into the next station uh, and another oven. Next up is the beverage centre. Oh, okay. Yeah, this was called beverage because it yep. was still carts, but bar yep. carts, beverages, storages, um, uh, chillers, oh. ice straw. Yep. This, this is really cool. I quite like this idea. If you've got a caravan, so these, these take two Atlas boxes. And if you've got an Atlas box right down the end there, you know, like, you just, Oh, okay. Well, you smell it. Bring it forward. Bring it just retractable. Yep. Here we go. And again, um, oh, well, that's you got one this side and one that side. Oh, so, okay. you know, yeah. the galley slaves in here. Yeah. Behind the bar. Doing coffee and all that sort of stuff. And these are all hot. The, uh, hot uh, these are water boilers. Yeah. And these are going coffee makers. Yeah. So the deal is up, up the front. So, yeah. Uh, uh, the premium cabin. And here's the ice bin, which is what it sounds like. And now moving on through the funnel cabin towards the rear of the aircraft. You've got the flight attendant seat, and behind that is a storage cupboard, and moving further along are a few more toilets. There's also a self-serve drink fountain. Moving around the other side there is another two toilets and the crew rest area which includes a number of bunk beds. They'll all come with their own light, air vent and emergency oxygen tank. Now these two orange things are the black boxes or the flight recorder. There's the voice recorder on the left and the flight data recorder is on the right. And then those little cylinders there are the underwater beacons that will emit an ultrasonic ping for 30 days from the depth of up to 6 kilometers. There's also an emergency escape door uh, where the crew can slide the bunk bed and then climb through that square hatch there. They'll then drop down right next to the bathrooms downstairs. Straight ahead is a door into the aft pressure bulkhead, which was interesting to see. And then we're heading back down the stairs and have a quick squeeze at the toilet. Now let's make our way out of the aircraft and past some of the staff. All of the members and guides here are volunteers and many have worked in the aviation industry and have an incredible wealth of aviation knowledge. 
and check out this view as we step off this plane with the iconic red flying kangaroo tail and then we spin around and there you'll see the Boeing 747-400 badge which I have no doubt will go down as an iconic sight in aviation. While this aircraft was the first of the 400 series flying for Qantas, I was on board the last 747-400ER VH Oscar Echo Juliet on the last ever commercial Qantas 747 flight in Canberra last year, and my video from that flight is on my channel. In fact, here's footage I captured of that very same aircraft leaving Australia for the last time where she overflew this aircraft here at Haas. The Haas Aviation Museum is located at Albion Park just south of Sydney and has a huge range of aircraft on display, including this 747, a Super Constellation, F-111, Canberra Bombers, DC-3 and even a Soviet MiG. It's definitely worth visiting, but just make sure you book ahead for the full Platinum 747 tour, as those spots do go fast. And if you're lucky, you may even see some of the fleet flying. A huge thanks to the staff here for letting me film this aircraft and if you're into aviation then please give the video a thumbs up and check out my channel for many more similar videos. Thanks for watching.